Late one chilly night in March, Martine Vick was out celebrating a big achievement with her friends. The night was full of laughter and dancing, and everything seemed perfect. But around 3 a.m., when her friends decided to head home, Martine made a choice that would change everything. She decided to stay out a little longer, leaving with someone she knew. That was the last time anyone would see her alive. By the next morning, her roommates realized she hadn't come back. They couldn't reach her because she'd lost her phone the week before. Panic set in, and they began searching for any sign of where she could be. As they dug deeper, they uncovered clues that led them down a dark path, one they could never have expected. Martine Vick was born on February 6, 1985, on a chilly winter day on the small island of Noya, Norway. She was the second of three children in the family, with an older brother Magnus and a younger sister Matilda. Her parents were well known in Noya, being one of the wealthiest families on the island. Martine and her siblings shared a close bond, especially the girls, who spent much of their time together playing and exploring. From an early age, Martine was full of energy and had an adventurous spirit. She loved climbing trees, building dollhouses, making snowmen, and swimming off the dock in the summers. Her first big dream was to become a prima ballerina, a goal she pursued passionately until it started to feel out of reach. She then turned to handball, finding a natural fit for her athleticism and becoming the top scorer on her team. Eventually, her interests shifted to horses and horseback riding which grew into a lifelong passion. After primary school in Noya, she attended a private high school in Oslo, where she worked hard to improve in certain subjects to pursue her goal of studying medicine. To gain experience, Martine worked with elderly patients in both a local hospital and a nearby nursing home. In 2006, her dedication paid off when she was accepted into the Medical University of Warsaw in Poland. By this point, her energetic and impulsive nature had transformed into kindness, inclusiveness, and a sense of responsibility. Though she remained vivacious and engaging, Martine was known for her warmth, sense of humor, and ability to empathize with others. Six months into her studies, however, Martine realized that medicine wasn't her true calling. In a surprising shift, she decided to study international business at the prestigious Henley Business School in England. In June 2007, she moved to a modest apartment in London with two female friends and a male friend, all Norwegians like herself. With her blonde hair, hazel eyes and slender figure, Martine was naturally popular among her peers. Though she never had a serious relationship, her friends often joked that every guy in London had a crush on her. Martine adored life in London, fully embracing both its social and academic opportunities. On the night of March 14, 2008, she planned to celebrate with her friends, marking the end of exams and her achievement as the top student in her class. That night, they went to Maddox, an exclusive club in a luxurious part of London frequented by celebrities like Madonna and Kira Knightley. Martine danced and enjoyed the night, reluctant to see it end. Around 3 a.m., however, her friends were exhausted and decided to head home. Eager to continue the festivities, Martine agreed to go to another party in town with her friend Farouk Abdulhaq, who offered to accompany her. Farouk, raised between the United States and Egypt, was the son of a Yemeni tycoon known as the Sugar King. Farouk grew up in a world of privilege, attending prestigious schools in Yemen, the UK, and briefly in the United States, where he is rumored to have obtained citizenship. Though from a conservative Islamic background, he identified as agnostic and was known for his affable personality and unassuming nature. Farouk lived in a high-end London apartment, costing nearly $800 per week, while he studied international business at the same university where he met Martine. Though he enjoyed London's nightlife and social scene, his father was said to have urged him to cut down on partying and focus on preparing to take over the family business. On Friday morning, when Martine hadn't returned home, her roommates realized she wasn't in her room and tried to reach her and her friend through social media. 
A week earlier, Martine had lost her cell phone, so social media was their only way to contact her. Checking Farouk's account, they noticed something odd. His last update around 4 a.m. stated he was home alone. Convinced Martine had left with him, her friends contacted everyone who had stayed at the club a bit longer to see if she might have changed plans and gone somewhere else, but all confirmed they saw her leave with Farouk. Growing increasingly worried, her housemates retraced her steps and distributed flyers with her photo, but no one knew where she was. By Saturday, they reported Martine as missing to Scotland Yard. However, the police initially assumed that a 24-year-old student partying in London would likely turn up soon. Her friends spent the next 24 hours urging the police to check Farouk's apartment, finally persuading them when they showed that he had deleted his social media profile. Meanwhile, one of Martine's friends informed her parents of her disappearance. When officers investigated the club, they found surveillance footage showing Martine leaving the parking lot at 2.59 a.m. on March 15th, arm in arm with Farouk. Two days later, when police searched Farouk's apartment building, they discovered Martine's partially clothed body in the basement. Attempts had been made to conceal her under debris. After the grim discovery, an official investigation was launched. A police spokesperson confirmed they were interested in speaking with Farouk about the incident involving his fellow student. By that time, however, authorities had already tracked his passport and learned he had taken a flight to Cairo, and it was suspected he may have fled to Yemen on his father's private jet. Farouk's family lawyer issued a statement asserting his innocence while Farouk sought refuge to avoid extradition. Martine's family traveled from Norway to the UK to learn what had happened. Her parents, along with their children, met with the police shortly after their arrival. Officers tried to prepare Martine's father for the difficult task of identifying his daughter, warning him that Martine was likely a victim of sexual assault and asphyxiation, and that she had signs of a fierce struggle on her body. However, nothing could truly prepare him for the heartbreak of seeing his daughter lifeless. He later described a profound inner pain, feeling as though something inside him had broken. The preliminary autopsy report on Martine was inconclusive, with some details withheld. It was established that she died from asphyxiation and had severe injuries around her neck, but investigators declined to confirm if a sexual element was involved in the attack. Martine's body also bore 43 cuts and abrasions. Investigators worked to trace high-send items her friends recalled seeing her wear the night she was last seen alive, including fitted jeans, snakeskin shoes, a Marc Jacobs bag, a Guess watch, Christian Dior earrings, and a silver diamond ring. A week after Martin's disappearance, the police interviewed numerous club attendees who confirmed seeing her with Farouk that night. The media soon labeled him a millionaire playboy. On April 30, 2008, a man in his 50s was arrested on suspicion of aiding Farouk's escape and obstructing justice. Martin's family received overwhelming support from the community and from some journalists and activists who sought to uncover the truth. Nonetheless, the tabloid press was quick to portray Martin as a party girl, frequenting exclusive London nightclubs and socializing with the wealthy elite. Martin's friends decided to speak out publicly to defend her, emphasizing that she had never led a life of luxury or had unlimited access to money. They described her as a down-to-earth person who worked hard to cover her own expenses. Though her family was financially comfortable, they raised her with values of independence and hard work. One friend noted that Martin wasn't spoiled, she was humble, and shared an apartment with three others splitting expenses. Another friend who knew her since childhood described Martin as charming, reliable, and always ready to stand up for others. One of her college friends told investigators she knew Farouk through Martin, but on the night of the incident, she noticed he behaved differently than usual, appearing irritated when someone took a photo of him with Martin. Another university acquaintance recalled that Farouk had once attempted to kiss Martin, but she made it clear she wasn't interested. Friends who had once been close to Farouk said they had lost all contact with him after he fled and found it hard to believe he could be involved in Martin's death. 
They felt his alleged involvement didn't match his character and mentioned that Martin often stayed at his apartment simply because it was conveniently located in an exclusive part of town. Once the forensic and legal procedures were completed in the UK, Martin's family was able to repatriate her body to Norway, where they held a funeral in her honor on July 30, 2008. After Farouk's continued refusal to face justice, the Metropolitan Police officially named him as a suspect. It confirmed what had been rumored from the start. Martin had been violated, though this information was initially omitted from the autopsy's preliminary report. Farouk was charged with sexual assault and first-degree murder landing him on the UK's most wanted list, an international arrest warrant was issued, and other countries' authorities were asked to assist in his capture. From that moment on, Martin's family and friends embarked on a journey for justice. Norway's authorities initiated international efforts to secure Farouk's extradition as the crime occurred on British soil, yet the UK had no extradition treaty with Yemen. In December 2009, public demonstrations erupted in Oslo, demanding justice for Martin, and support groups formed online. Norwegians joined the family in a torchlit march, pressing government ministers to take action for Farouk's extradition to London. Outside Norway's parliament building, they urged the government to make Martin's case a priority on the international stage. Martin's father became the central figure in pushing Norway's Ministry of Foreign Affairs to advocate for his daughter's case. He criticized the government's lack of progress. However, the foreign minister stated that all diplomatic avenues had been exhausted, pledging to report any new developments. In December 2008, the UK's Office of the Prosecutor submitted an extradition request to Yemen, but it was formally denied two months later. It became evident that Farouk's billionaire father, a close ally of Yemen's president, wielded enough influence to obstruct justice. Confident in his father's power, Farouk led a luxurious, carefree life in Yemen, as reported by Norwegian media covering the case. Articles stated he was seen moving freely in Yemen, living with his family and possibly planning to return to the United States. At this stage, Martin's father met with the U.S. ambassador to Norway, drawing the embassy into the case as Farouk also held U.S. citizenship. Dialogues with authorities began, seeking support to hold Farouk accountable. One year later, between 1,000 and 2,000 people marched once more in Martin's memory, calling on Norwegian authorities to apply further political pressure for a resolution. The march received extensive media coverage. In Norway and the UK, over 100 newspapers reported on it. Two days later, Norway's foreign minister met with Martin's support group, who presented him with a petition signed by two, seven, zero, zero, zero people. The minister promised that Martin's case would be addressed in any discussions with British, Yemeni, and US authorities, yet little progress was being made. In 2010, Martin's father wrote a letter to Queen Elizabeth, appealing for help and seeking justice for his daughter. In response, the Queen referred the matter to then-Mayor of London, Boris Johnson. As a show of support, the British government promised commitment and stayed in contact with Martin's father. But their efforts were repeatedly thwarted by Yemeni authorities' protection of Farouk. In 2019, there was a significant shift in the case. Yemen, gripped by political turmoil, saw its controversial president step down. Amidst the chaos, hope grew that Martin's assailant might finally be brought to justice. At that time, Farouk's lawyer reportedly suggested he should return to London to face trial. Both the Yemeni government and opposition seemed supportive of a trial in the UK, but Farouk resisted any steps toward facing justice. On the sixth anniversary of Martin's murder, Scotland Yard revealed that Farouk had married in his hometown. They issued an unprecedented social media appeal to him and his new family, emphasizing his status as an internationally wanted individual. The head of the Metropolitan Police's Homicide and Serious Crimes Unit confirmed that Martin's case remained an active investigation. Despite relentless diplomatic efforts to secure Farouk's return to the UK, no progress was made. However, on March 8, 2022, 
the police arrested a second suspect believed to be an accomplice. The authorities, known for their discretion, revealed only that the individual was a woman in her 60s, arrested on suspicion of aiding Farouk, and though the nature of her involvement was not disclosed, the arrest was seen as a breakthrough, and she was later released on bail and no further information emerged. In March 2023, a special investigative report renewed interest in the case, bringing fresh hope to Martin's family, who had exhausted all avenues in their quest for truth and justice. Over more than a decade, hundreds of journalists had attempted unsuccessfully to interview Farouk. Only when a Yemeni woman managed to gain his trust did a confession finally come to light. Through a series of conversations on social media and with intermediaries, Farouk exchanged messages with her over five months, eventually sharing revelations. Initially, he avoided direct mention of Martin or the tragic incident, speaking only of a mistake he had made in his youth, which he claimed prevented him from returning to the UK. In the thousands of messages and voice notes he sent, Farouk consistently referred to the event as an incident or accident, despite forensic evidence of severe violence. However, in one of his messages, he issued a profound apology, referring to the matter as an unfortunate sexual accident during a game gone wrong. He expressed deep regret not only for what happened to Martin, but also for fleeing to Yemen without facing the consequences of his actions. Farouk claimed it was difficult for him to remember the events of that night, stating that even he could barely piece together what had transpired due to his use of cocaine and alcohol. Hearing Farouk's words was incredibly difficult for Martin's father, as it was the first time he heard the voice of the man who had taken his daughter's life. Yet Farouk's statements marked a turning point offering an admission of guilt for the first time. Rejecting Farouk's attempt to downplay the brutal crime as an accident, the journalist urged him to return to the UK and explain what happened to Martin, stating that she and her family deserved closure. A spokesperson from Scotland Yard publicly questioned Farouk's claims, asserting that Martin's injuries did not align with an accident but pointed to a violent crime. Marks on her neck indicated compression or asphyxiation, and her body showed signs of struggle, suggesting that she had tried to defend herself. Martin's tragic death and the call for justice sparked worldwide attention with over 1-500-0-0 people joining social media groups advocating for her case. Farouk remained completely isolated. His entire family, including his daughter and ex-wife, now lives outside Yemen, having fled the ongoing civil war that has devastated the country. As of the latest update in November 2024, Farouk has not dared to visit any family members abroad, fearing arrest. That's the end of today's case. Thank you for joining us on the Crime Storytelling channel. If you're interested in more intriguing true crime stories, especially from Latin America, be sure to check out our new channel, Latin Crimes. Click the link to subscribe and explore more mysteries with us. See you next time.